All right, please turn to John 3. It's good to see everybody. Awesome. We had a a great first service, and I trust uh, we'll have a a great second service. Uh, Worship was, as we said, just so fantastic, Uh, just lifting up the name of the Lord and and glorifying Him. And, you know, for a little bit there, you you know, you start to think you're in heaven, man, especially when uh, Sheila was uh, praising the Lord for being the only one that was worthy and is worthy to open that scroll who shed his blood. So, uh, we could be saved. In John chapter 3, uh, last week I had a message uh, called Born What? The question mark. And this is part 2 of that message. Born what? Question mark. Born again. Exclamation point. And uh, I wanted to deal with this at least a couple times. Because uh, Jesus stated emphatically, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And last week I shared with you uh, that a couple days prior to that, a couple of gentlemen came up to me and they just, you know, they just asked me, you know, is it... You know, they asked me if I was a cop first for some strange reason. Then they asked me what I did for, you know, what, what my career choice was and let them know that I was a, a pastor of a church. And, and that we embarked into a very, you know, 45 minute or so uh, talk about faith and religion and what have you. And uh, Josiah was with me and we had a great chat with these guys. And uh, we, as we talked to them, uh, the guy was wanting to hear a lot about my opinions. And when I'd quote the scripture and say, this is what Jesus taught, he would usually say, often say, I should say, no, I really, I don't want you to quote the Bible. What's your gut? What do you feel? I want to hear your gut, you know? He'd been drinking a little bit, you know? And I was trying to tell him, my gut is not worth anything. You know, you want to hear the word, you know? And opinions are just that, opinions, but we've got the living truth. And as we talked and I shared with him uh, the importance, the need for being uh, born again uh, and how God had changed my life and that I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Uh, he said, oh, I've heard that before. I've heard people that a lot of times talk about how they've been born again. And, 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 you know, and usually you know, they were drug addicts or drunks or, or whatever. The lives were messed up, and then they said that God changed their lives. And isn't that kind of, what is that? Isn't that like just you change from one thing that you're into, and you just kind of change focus to God? Is that what that is? And, and what have you. And he had a Catholic background. I mentioned that last week, so I won't get into depth into my discussion other than to say that I emphasize to him that it's not religion that saves you. It's not rituals that save you. It's a relationship with the living God. And that being born again is not something to be trivialized, but it actually speaks of a profound spiritual experience that you must have if you are to enter heaven. And as I began to share the two roads, the broad road and the narrow, the one that leads to destruction, the one that leads to life, he got really scared at that point, and said, I don't think I'm getting in, you know, because he was talking about everybody makes it kind of thing, and I started sharing scripture with him, and it was a scripture that had an impact on him, but I let him know that he needed to be born again, and that it was not my words, it wasn't some, uh, something I or somebody had made up where we attached, you know, this to a version of Christianity, you know, that, well, we ascribe to this version of Christianity that you, you know, you should be born again, that it's Jesus himself that actually taught, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. You see, and, and if anyone is a Christian, they are born again. If anyone's born again, they are a Christian. If you, you can't be a, a believer without being born again. In fact, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1 says, He that believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. So all those who truly trust Jesus Christ are born again. And a lot of people just don't understand what that means. Even millions of professing believers because they just don't read the scripture. You know, uh, when the term being born again became more and more popular way back in the 70s and what have you, it was like a new terminology to people. They didn't, because people weren't conversant with scripture, but it's the actual teaching of Jesus Christ. The same Bible, the same New Testament has talked about being born again, the same gospel accounts ever since the first century, you know, nearly 2,000 years ago. This was written in the Scripture. and actually was written in the Old Testament as well. So we need to understand that we as believers need to tell people what Jesus told people. Do you ever use that language? Do you tell people you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God? I think it's a great way to witness. I think it's a great way to share the gospel. That's what Jesus did here in John chapter 3. There's different ways to go about sharing the gospel. But one way that Jesus shared the gospel, which we see right here, was by declaring to Nicodemus, a very religious man, that you must be born again. And that gives me a clue, because Jesus said different things to different people to let them know that they need to put their trust in him to have eternal life. To the woman at the well, 
who was dying of thirst. He talked about how she needed living water. But here to a very religious man who thought that he was going to make it with God into heaven by pulling himself up by his own bootstraps, here we see something quite different. Here we see he tells him that he must be born again. And this is a very, very good way to speak to people who feel like they're religious and they're going to heaven, whether they're involved in the New Age movement, whether they're involved in uh, ritualism, that's so much of it that's found in Catholicism, uh, what have you. There's various people, not just Roman Catholics, but there's all kinds of Protestants that do the religious thing but haven't truly been born again. There's a need to be born again. And and I'm not going to go through every verse. Last week we went through verses 1. Uh, through, I think, like through 21. And uh, we're just going to cover a few verses in John chapter 3, but we're going to go to other verses in the Scripture as well and get a little bit deeper than we did last week in this message. And in chapter 3, verse 1, we read, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time to his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then it carries on, and we looked at the other verses last week as well. But I pointed out a few things to you last week about Nicodemus that I think are important to keep in mind, is that Nicodemus, uh, first and foremost, was a very religious man. He was a Pharisee. It says that in verse 1. The Pharisees were one of the prominent Jewish sects, religious sects of the time. Last week, we got into some depth as to what the Pharisees were about, so I won't say much about that other than to say they were the most religious uh, sect as far as the custodians of the law are among the most religious of the first century. And they exist with us to this day. Even though in the first centuries you had the zealots, uh, as far as Jewish sects goes, the Hellenists, the Herodians, the the Sadducees, the Essenes, and all these different uh, groups, the Pharisees exist with us to this day in Israel. You see, when we ministered to Jews uh, last time we went to Israel, some identified themselves as Pharisees. And it's interesting because the Pharisees were so religious, you know, Jesus even talked about how they tithed their dill and cumin, their different, uh, you know, their different spices from their gardens. They would give 10% of the grains to God. They were so meticulous and wanted to be right with God through what they did. And what happened is it began to go to their heads, you see. They began to trust in their own righteousness rather than the grace of God. They didn't understand the utter significance of all the animal sacrifices that were inculcated within the law of God that were a picture of the ultimate sacrifice of the Lamb of God, the Messiah himself, prophesied in Isaiah 53 and other passages, who would die for their sins. They separated, uh, uh, you know, they began to look at the law and began to become proud. You know, they were proud of their long robes, their phylacteries, they'd, you know, have the scripture, you know, uh, wrapped around their head, literally boxes. You see this in Israel this day with some of the Orthodox Jews with the scriptures in the, on top of their head, you know, walking around with the scripture. Because the Bible says, hey, you know, write the scripture on the tablets of your heart, right? And, and to uh, write them on your forehead. And they literally put scripture on their forehead. You know, and these people were very religious. They would literally be on corners and they would use, we think of it's hyperbole when Jesus talked about trumpets when they would give. Some of them actually did that. Okay, they were very into their religion, yet that religion wasn't saving them. So Nicodemus was a very religious man. Uh, He was only religious, but he was a ruler of the Jews, as we read in verse 1. And the ruler of the Jews were, uh, there were less than a hundred members of the Sanhedrin, and, or the Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish group of, kind of like the Supreme Court in America today. They were like the Jewish Supreme Court. So he was a religious man, very religious. He was one of the rulers of the Jews. He was rich. 
We know that from John chapter 19 because he's the one that took care of Jesus' burial, which would cost a fortune uh, and with the spices and everything that were used. And we also know in verse 10 that he was a rabbi, the teacher of Israel. Not just a rabbi, but the rabbi of Israel. Either the most prominent or one of the most prominent rabbis at that time in the early part of the first century. Having said all of that, he wasn't going to heaven. It didn't matter how religious he was. It doesn't matter how religious you are. It doesn't get you to heaven. It didn't matter that he was a person of authority. He was a ruler. It didn't get him to heaven. He wasn't going to heaven because of that. It doesn't matter your position in society. It didn't matter that uh, you know, he was rich. Because Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to get in the kingdom of God than it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Money's not going to get you in the kingdom of God. That's not going to, you're not going to buy your way to heaven. And he couldn't get in that way. It didn't matter that he was a rabbi, that he was a teacher. Being a teacher doesn't get you into heaven. In fact, it says in James chapter 3, verse 1, uh, let not many of you seek to be teachers, for a teacher shall incur a stricter judgment from God. So being a teacher doesn't get you into heaven. You must be what? Born again to enter the kingdom of God. Because along with those four R's, you know, being a rabbi and being a, a ruler and being rich and, and you know, uh, being religious, he was one other thing that banned him from heaven. He was ruined. He was a ruined man. And we talked about that last week, but I want to spend a little bit more time instead of on those first four R's, that last one, and then a little bit more about the relationship that he needed to find with the living God. See, he was a ruined man. The Bible says the heart is what? Deceitful above all things and desperately what? Wicked. Who can know it? That's the human condition. The human heart without God, without being transformed, left to itself, is ruined. It's because we were created upright, it says. God created, when he created man, he says, he didn't just say he was good, he says he was very good. And it says in the scripture in Ecclesiastes, God made every, you know, made us upright. We were made upright. But then when mankind rebelled against God, which is what we call original sin, when man turned away from God and sought to do his own will, he became a rebel. We became a race of devils, so to speak. The word devil in the Greek is, uh, the word, word means opposer, one that's opposed to God. Actually, the word Satan means opposer, the word, which is the word satanus or Satan. But the word uh, uh, that we get devil from, diablos, is, speaks literally of a slander, an accuser, you see. And what happened is we followed Satan's rebellion. Satan manifests that rebellion among the human race. The scriptures tell us that Satan is the one who sins from the beginning, First John chapter 3. And that he was, a, he was a murderer from the beginning. There's no truth in him. But he led the first humans astray. And humanity has, each of us, the scripture says, has gone to his what? Own way. Right? Each has sought his own path. So what happened is we've become a race of rebels against God, doing our own thing. The Bible says that the human mind, you know, cannot please God. And that we're, at, we're hostile toward God in our hearts. And that, that no one seeks after God. And the scriptures say that, you know, that we are children of wrath. And the scriptures paint a very, very bleak picture of humanity. And uh, Jesus was very, very clear that even the most religious people of the day, even the Pharisees, we're not going to heaven. Nicodemus was not going to heaven in his own primitive, fallen state. In fact, Jesus said to his disciples, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So, and that must have just, and I've mentioned that before, because that must have just blown them away. Because keep in mind, it was like the Pharisees, it's like, man, these guys were holier than thou. They were the most religious folks around, man. So if these folks aren't going to make it to heaven, how in the world are we going to get to heaven? And then Jesus said, your righteousness has to exceed their righteousness. That must have blown them away. But guess what? Because the Pharisees could not enter the kingdom based on their what? Their righteousness. In fact, look at what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Turn, please, to Matthew chapter 23. And Jesus had a lot to say about the Pharisees and he, he, because a lot of people were trusting in the Pharisees' righteousness or trying to emulate them. 
And Jesus said, because the new covenant had not yet been inaugurated through Christ's blood, so he says in the beginning of Matthew 23 to obey them as long as they're speaking from the law of Moses at that point. But he goes on to talk about from verse, verses, the first couple verses onward, he's talking to the crowds and the disciples, verse 1. He's talking about the Pharisees sitting in the seat of Moses and, and, and so forth. But he goes on to talk about how even though they're teaching the law of Moses, how they're failing to keep the law themselves and how they are not heaven-bound but hell-bound. In fact, pick it up at verse 13 where he begins to talk about the eight different woes, the eight different judgments on the Pharisees. He says, but woe to you or judgment to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people for you do not enter in yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. Did you see what he said there? First, he called them hypocrites. Hypocrites. And hypocrites, that was a, a word used in Greek theater of the day for those who would take a mask, an actor who would put a, a mask on. And you've seen the, the, the symbol of theaters, theater to this day, right? Those two masks they put together. Well, that comes from the Greek theater where they put a mask on and then they'd go out and act out the character of the mask that they were wearing. But they would obviously be acting something far different than they actually, what, were. And Jesus was letting us know, letting the people know in the first century that the Pharisees, even though they wore this huge religious mask, were not in truth following the Lord, were not truly born again. They they didn't know God. They were involved in rituals, yes. Religion, yes. But a relationship with God, no. In fact, Jesus said of them, they draw close to him, and they quoted Isaiah, that they draw close to the Lord with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. You see, what they needed were new hearts. Now, they were seeking to keep the law, but they were keeping the law and the efforts in which they were seeking to keep the law were founded upon or based upon their fallen hearts. They didn't have new hearts. They needed a miracle from God. They needed to be made anew. In fact, that may, there may be people here today at Blessed Hope Chapel who are doing religious things and trying to live a religious life, but you haven't had a changed heart. You haven't, you haven't surrendered your heart to Jesus and asked Him to come into your life and make you anew, to give you a new heart. You haven't been born again. Your trust is not in Jesus for your salvation. And you need to be born again because the Pharisees were the most religious of the religious. Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, before he was transformed and born again, he was called Saul. And he was having Christians killed. And he was a Pharisee of Pharisees, he says. He was a very religious man. I mean, Paul was like a blow mine. You look at his life and you say, wow, what a religious man. Circumcised the eighth day from the tribe of Benjamin, you know, as the law in his own eyes, blameless, you know. Seemed like it had it all together. But Paul said he was a violent aggressor. A violent aggressor who was having people killed. Did you know that? Paul talks about how he would even take people, he'd go to their homes, if they were professing Christians, he'd have them dragged out of their homes, and he'd make them blaspheme the name of Christ or have them killed. Paul says he was causing people to blaspheme. Yet Paul thought he knew God. He thought he was so religious. He was doing it in the name of God, persecuting Christians. Yet Paul came to realize and called himself the chief of sinners. And he said when he called himself the chief of sinners, that is for this reason that Jesus Christ came to save sinners, of which I am the chief or the foremost. And then Paul gave his testimony. He said that God saved him and had mercy upon him so others could know that if they would come to Jesus, they too could be saved. See, Paul needed to be born again. Nicodemus needed to be born again. Look at verse 25. Look at what Jesus continues. We're, just, we're skipping most, almost you know, over half this chapter because he says so much about the Pharisees. But... In verse 24, he calls them blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel, you see. They'll strain out from their drink a gnat because a gnat would be an unclean food to eat. Man, i got to strain, make sure I don't eat a gnat. I'll eat something unclean. I want to keep the law. Yet they would swallow a camel. They would miss the main point. Jesus spoke of mercy and righteousness and justice that they left out. It wasn't in their hearts. In verse 25, he says, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You see, the Pharisees looked very, very clean on the outside. You know, they looked very, very religious, but inwardly they were filled with robbery. It talks about Jesus talked about how they would devour widows' houses. 
That means if a woman's uh, or a, a wife lost her husband and was destitute. They didn't have social security and they didn't have Medicare and they didn't have all those things then. And then what these Pharisees would often do is they would go take advantage of her and try to get a lot of her money for themselves. You see, these were men that had corrupt hearts that were dressed up in religious garb. And even though they tried to pride themselves and justify their actions, you see, the Pharisees were the, the richest people at that time in Judaism, the Pharisees, the rabbis, were often the richest men taking advantage of other people, kind of like the word faith teachers do today. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. They're living for themselves. Verse 26, you blind Pharisees, says Jesus, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. You see, the inside needed to be clean. The heart of the Pharisee needed to be changed. It needed to be cleansed. It needed to be transformed. And that's what needs to happen to religious people today. They're doing all these religious things, but their hearts need to be cleansed. Verse 27, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly are you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. What an incredible picture. You know, he said the, the Pharisees looked like these graves, you know, with these beautiful ornate tombstones that were just so beautiful. And in those days, I mean, tombstones were about some of those beautiful things you would see. Listen carefully. Think about it. And it wasn't like all the stuff we look at today. I mean, tombstones, they were a lot of money. The Jewish people cared a lot for their dead. And a lot of money was put into burial tombstones. And people would just trip out on the tombstones. He says, that's how you Pharisees are. You look great. But there's more to the tombstone and the grave than the tombstone. You're like those tombs outwardly. But inwardly, you're just like them too. Because inwardly, you're full of dead men's bones and uncleanness. Verse 27. You're full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Verse 28. You see, Jesus said to the religious leaders who came down on his disciples for not cleaning their hands when they ate in the ritualistic Jewish way. He said, to, he said, it's not what goes into the body that defiles the man, but that which comes out of the heart. And in Mark 7, he says, out of the heart come evil thoughts and blasphemies and wickedness and fornications and all these different things Jesus mentioned. And those things defile the man. And Jesus was letting them know, it wasn't by your rituals that you were being made clean. Your hearts are evil. And they need to be cleansed. They need to be changed. And you know what? That's the great need in the world that we live in right now, guys. That's the great need. Because right now, our greatest problem as human beings is not the economy. Our greatest problems are, are not uh, scientific, needing more scientific breakthroughs or global warming or things like that. The greatest problem that humans face by far and away, is inner corruption. The corruption of the human heart. You can say, yeah, but look at the problems we have in politics. Yeah, that's the outside of the cup. That's because people's hearts are inwardly corrupt. That's because people's hearts are corrupt. And Barack Obama and, you know, McCain, they can talk all about how they're going to bring outward political, uh, you know, reformation because of the corruption in government and they're both talking about, you know, uh, oh, you know, McCain just, you know, appointed a, a vice president nominee, Palin, uh, who's done a very good job from what the reports say uh, of cleaning up corruption in, in uh, over in Alaska. And Barack Obama's talking about being an outsider, wanting to come into Washington to clean up Washington, even though he was an insider in Chicago, which has had its problems. But it's interesting, they're both talking about reforming government and changing the world. One of them is even talking about healing the world. But guess what? The world's not going to get fixed by outward political reformation. The nation's not going to get fixed by political outward. You know what? The, we need not political outward reformation. We need spiritual inward regeneration. That's what we need. That's what people need. Because you can transform things all you want on the outward. And guess what? The human heart is still sinful, isn't it? You can have the best system. And in the United States, I think we have probably the best system on earth, government-wise. You know, it's preserved our rights. 
We're able to worship freely. Amen. People can come out of nowhere like a Barack Obama and, and all of a sudden, you know, make it somewhere in, in life, you know. And we got a great system, but guess what? We have a huge crime rate in our country. And we have a lot of perversion in our country because it doesn't matter how good your system is, the heart is what needs to be changed. Amen. And government cannot change your heart. Government cannot make you born again. Religion can't do it. Riches can't do it. Leadership can't do it. All these things that Nicodemus had, those things can't do it. We must what? Jesus said you must be what? Born again to enter the kingdom of God. That's the answer for each and every individual. We need a heart transplant. We need to be transformed from within. Not political outward uh, reformation, but spiritual inward regeneration. Have you experienced that? Have you been born again by the Spirit of God? That's the question. And Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and the Pharisees regarding this. He says in verse 29, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, If we had been living in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. So you testify against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of the guilt of your fathers. In other words, when Jesus is saying, woe to you Pharisees, because inwardly you're unclean, of course, at that point, many of them are justifying themselves. Many of them are saying, oh, wait a minute, how are we unclean? You know, look at, I mean, we're children of Abraham. And guess what? Jesus gives them an example. Okay, you're guilty of shedding the blood of the prophets. And you're going to say, well, hey, if I was back then, I wouldn't have done what my, our fathers did. I wouldn't have killed the prophets. And he says, you're testifying that you're sons of those who killed the prophets. And yet, guess what they're doing right now? They're rejecting Jesus Christ, the ultimate prophet, the very son of God. Amen? That's who they're rejecting. And if you study the history of Israel and you read through the Old Testament, you'll see over and over and over again they reject the prophets that God sends to them. In fact, uh, Jesus goes on to say in verse 34, Therefore, behold, I am sending you prophets and wise men and scribes. Some of them uh, you will crucify, kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city so that upon you may fall the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Truly I say to you, these things will come upon this generation. You know what? Even Elijah in the Old Testament, you know, what did he say? He said, God, as they were chasing him, trying to kill him, the prophet of God, he said, Lord, you know, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. That was an indictment against how they had treated the prophets. And Jesus was letting them know in the, in the first century, look, this is your nature. This is who you are. And in John chapter 8, when he said, you say you have Abraham as your father, Jesus said to them, but you are of your father the devil. And then in Matthew chapter 3, Jesus, you know, John the Baptist is baptizing, and some of them came out to watch him baptize. And he said, what did you come out to watch? A reed being shaken in the wind? He said, don't say you have Abraham as your father, for God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these very stones. He said, the, head, the axe is already laid to the root of the tree. And he talked about being thrown in the fire. Quite serious language. What Jesus is getting across, what John the Baptist is getting across, John says, you must repent. He said, repent. Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Jesus said, you must become like a little child in the kingdom of God. Jesus said to the scribes and Pharisees, he said, you're not going to enter the kingdom. You're keeping others out and you're not going in. And Jesus said, you must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And those words that were given to the most religious, most outwardly righteous people on earth in the first century apply to everyone today. We must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Not one person here is any better than any of these Pharisees. And so when Jesus said, hey, you know, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees to get in the kingdom. Why? Because Jesus said they're Pharisees right here. Matthew 23, we're not getting into the kingdom. That's why. Well, then, then how do I become more righteous? Then I got to tithe better. I got to not give 10%. I got to give 11%. I've got to do that. No, 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 that's not going to do it. You're good. It's not about what you can do. It's about what God needs to do to you. It's about the fact that we need to be born again. We need to be changed from the inside out. We need a miracle from God because it can't be about outward reformation. We need inward regeneration. That's why Jesus said to the, the Jews in the Old Testament, he said the leopard you know, can't change his spots. 
He said, neither can you who are accustomed to doing evil change the way you are. We cannot, through self-effort, all of a sudden earn God's favor by becoming righteous enough because our natures are fallen. That's the problem. You could try to do things right and say, I'm going to try to do things right and, and please God. But guess what? Your heart is the problem. Our hearts are the problem. You know, because our hearts are evil, that Jesus said, and out of the heart comes evil. Therefore, the things we touch, the things we do, end up being adversely affected by evil. It's like the mechanic, you know, whose hands are full of grease. Everything he touches becomes dirty. That's how we are as human beings. That's why we need a spiritual transformation. That's why Jesus said you must be born again to enter to the kingdom of God. You see, people in the world that don't know Jesus Christ, that aren't saved, who haven't had changed hearts, they don't have the power to live righteous lives. Why do you think the drug addict continues to stick a dirty needle in his arm even though he knows he's going to probably get AIDS and die a horrible death? Because he doesn't have the power and the grace of God and the transformed nature whereby he can overcome that habit in and of himself. Oh, what about the drunkard? How come the drunkard continues to hit that bottle and continues to get drunk even though he knows it's going to cost him his family? How come? Because he hasn't had a transformed heart. Or how come the gambler continues to gamble even though he knows he's going to lose his home and he'll just spend that last cent and go into incredible debt because that heart has not been transformed or he's not relying upon uh, the power of God? Or how come a thief will continue to steal even though he knows he's going to end up in prison? Or the sexual pervert will continue to commit adultery or fornication or get involved in sexual perversion even though he knows it's going to destroy his marriage because he needs a changed heart. He needs to turn and submit to the one true living God and allow God to change his heart because the Bible says that we are hostile in our minds toward God until we're born again. And that we cannot be subjected, Romans chapter 8 says, to the law of God until there's a transformation that takes place in our lives. You can say, oh, but I know this one guy, uh, he, you know, he got off of getting drunk. I mean, he went to AA and he's not getting drunk anymore and he wasn't born again. Well, guess what? You may be able to stop a habit, but it's like plugging one hole in the dike only to watch three other holes open up. That's why I think Bill Wilson, who started AA, is a great example. Because Bill Wilson had a whole thing about 12 steps to, you know, to actually stop being an alcoholic. We're not really stopping an alcoholic, right? They admitted you can't stop being an alcoholic through AA. You're still an alcoholic. You just stop getting drunk, but you're still an alcoholic. But Bill Wilson, the tragedy of his life, if you read his life story, was that he was a serial adulterer. He was involved in grievous sin throughout his life. And even on his deathbed, he was crying out for more whiskey before he died. That's the guy who started AA. Guys, because AA or AA does not bring, Alcoholics Anonymous does not bring a transformation of the heart. That's why in AA they'll say you're still an alcoholic. You just got to, you got to keep coming here. But guess what? I read in the Bible, man, in 1 Corinthians 6, be not deceived, neither, you know, the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither drunkards, adulterers, you know, effeminate homosexuals, thieves, revilers, extortioners. It gives this huge list. It says will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then it says, and such were some of you, you see. Such were some of you. You aren't still an alcoholic. If you're trusting Jesus Christ, you don't need to go to the AA meeting and say, I'm an alcoholic and da-da-da-da. That, that's one step away from getting drunk again. Because you come to Jesus and you truly surrender to him, he gives you a new heart. Now you have to make sure you don't allow that old man to rise up in your life. But so long as you keep that old man wrecking him dead, right? That man you used to be. And you live in the power of the Spirit. You are an overcomer. You are a victor. You are a former alcoholic. Amen. You are a former pervert. You no longer. You don't go around saying, "I'm still a sexual pervert." I'm um, one step away from you know, you know, leaving my wife and kids. No, you can be a new person in Christ Jesus. You know, you don't have to walk around saying, "I'm still a thief. I'm still going to rob banks if I get the slightest chance." 
No, you could have, that can become your past where it's not something you even think about anymore. Amen? Where you walk in the Spirit. Because being born again brings a total transformation of the life. In fact, you know, the recidivism rate in AA is quite high. A lot of people go back. And I've been to a couple AA meetings, you know, uh, when I first met Lisa or started, we started fellowshipping together. She's a new Christian. Uh, she was in the AA and NA and CA. <laughs> she was in all those groups. And, and I told her all she needs is Jesus, you know. But I went to a couple of her meetings, and it was like people, I just uh, went back and got drunk again. And you hear this over and over and over again, you know. And, you know, oh, and I have so many, I have so many years but they're, you know, you go in there, you think there's a fire, you think you need to call the fire department, man, there's just smoke billowing out the doors, you know, and people are the worst kind of language, and everybody's sleeping with everybody. People need to be born again is what needs to happen, guys. In fact, you know what? The recidivism rate in Teen Challenge, they have an 86% success rate in Teen Challenge. Blows away AA. Why? Because they take some of the worst drug addicts in Teen Challenge, far worse than you'll often see in AA. And they'll have such radical transformation because in Teen Challenge, they have such a great success rate. Why? Because they emphasize the need to be what? Born again. I've met, met many, many, many. In fact, we've helped Teen Challenge, our uh, fellowship has to a degree uh, in, here in Ventura County. Uh, we've given them our videos to use and what have you. We've met so many people that have been transformed by the power of Christ that have the most incredible testimonies. And the reason they have such a great success rate is because they preach Jesus. Because there's a miracle that takes place in their hearts. And it's not these kids just getting off of drugs. It's these kids getting off of drugs and getting off of, away from sexual abuse and getting away from crime and everything else because of Jesus Christ. Amen? Because of the power of Jesus Christ. In fact, Lisa and I just sat with a gal uh, a week and a half ago during counseling. Uh, and we're counseling her sister, but she came in with her sister and she's a young gal in her 20s and we saw this gal a couple years ago and she was just a mess we hadn't seen her for some time we just saw her briefly when we met at the old building two and a half years ago the last building we we're in before here whenever that was two and a half three years ago and you know what she's totally different now and we hadn't seen her once or twice i think she, we saw her once she, we just she was just introduced to us and she was gone you know well we didn't know what happened to her we saw her again a couple weeks ago and She's in her right mind, and she's quoting Scripture, and she'd been through Teen Challenge, you see. And it's not Teen Challenge that does it. It's Jesus. Jesus transforms the heart. He makes us new. Amen? He gives us new life. And, of course, Jesus said to Nicodemus, he said to him, well, look at verse 33. Look at what Jesus says. You serpents, chapter 23, verse 33, he says to the Pharisees, you serpents, you brood of vipers. You, that's a, that means family of snakes. How will you escape the sentence of hell? How will you escape the sentence of hell? He told them they're going to hell. This is very, very serious, guys. You know? These guys are on their way to hell. And they think they're the... And everybody thinks these guys... If anyone's going to heaven, the Pharisees are. Yet Jesus told them they're going to hell. And you know what? Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You notice Nicodemus didn't say to him... Why? Why should I have to be born again? He says, how? Why did he not say why? And why did he say how? Because I, don't, I believe Nicodemus knew that he needed a heart change. Because I believe Nicodemus, like the Apostle Paul, before he was the Apostle Paul, and when he was a Pharisee named Saul, he knew he needed a heart change. In fact, Paul himself tells us before he was saved, and you look at uh, Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, Paul is, look at the context there. He's talking about before he was saved. It's real clear. Back up at the beginning of chapter 7, verse 5, 6, 7, and 8, when you look at chapter 7. And Paul's talking about when he was a little kid, before he was even aware of what sin was. Then he became aware of the law. And he says, when I became aware of the law, he says, then it revealed the sin in my life, that I was a sinner. And he says, the things I want to do, I couldn't do. And the things I didn't want to do for God, I ended up, you know, against God, I ended up doing them. Who will save me from this wretched man that I am? Thanks be to Jesus Christ. That's the one who would save him. Because the law could not save Paul. The law continued to show, show Paul that he was a rotten sinner. That he was blowing it. That he needed God's grace. And that's why he cries out, wretched man that I am, who will save me you know, from this body of death? And that's why Paul in Galatians chapter 3 said that the law is a tutor that shows us and leads us to Jesus Christ. It reveals to us our sin. But the law does not have the power to make us new. 
and to give us life. In fact, it says, Paul says in Galatians, he says, if God could, could have given a law whereby he could have imparted life, he would have given another law. But righteousness doesn't come through the law. It shows us what God's standard is, but it doesn't make us righteous. It shows us that we're sinners. In fact, look at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. And Paul does an incredible job by quoting various passages and verses from the Mosaic law, or I should say from the prophets who indict the Jewish people for breaking God's holy law. And in Romans chapter 3, he quotes verse after verse showing man's depravity. Verse 9, we'll start at verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Paul is saying, are we, meaning Jews, better than they, the Gentiles? Because in chapter 1 of Romans, Paul showed the perverse wickedness of the Gentile nations and how even though they knew God, they did not glorify God, but God gave them over to all kinds of debased passions and unnatural desires. And he goes on to mention homosexuality and hatred and murder and all these things. So he shows the failure of the antediluvian world, how the Gentiles are just perverse, not knowing God. And then Paul says in chapter 3, verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. He's quoting Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 through 3 there. There is not one righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. Remember Jesus said, you're like the tombs. You look nice on the outside, but you're really like dead man's bones within. Paul's saying the same thing. Man, your throats are like open graves. They lead down to the depths of your being, which is perverse and wicked and stinking, smelly like an open grave. Their, their throat is an open grave. With their tongue, they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips. He's quoting Psalm 5, 9 there in Psalm 140, verse 3. Whose mouths, mouths are full of cursing and bitterness, Psalm 10, verse 7. Their feet are swift to shed blood, Isaiah 59, 7. Also Proverbs chapter 6, verses 16, 17, and 18. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And their paths of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. Psalm 36, verse 1. He's quoting all these verses, which from the prophets and from the psalmist show that there's a huge, horrible problem of sin with God's people, Israel. Verse 19, Paul says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. In other words, if the Jews are accountable to God because of their failure, how much the rest of the world? If the Pharisees aren't making it, how much more are we not making it on our own? Amen? Verse 20. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his, in his sight. For through the law comes the what? Knowledge of sin. You see, the law was not given to save us. The law was given to show us who God is, His holy standard. And then His standard is be perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect, says Jesus. And as God says in the whole Old Testament, be holy as I am holy. And as it says in First Peter chapter 1 and 2, be holy as He is holy. You know, And we can never be as holy as He is holy in our own selves or by our own righteousness. Amen? And we put ourselves up to the standard of God's law and we say, wow, woe is me. I am undone. Even Isaiah the prophet said that of himself. We find out we're in huge trouble. But what happens is, People be, that had the law, many of the Jews that had the law, they began to pride themselves. They look, God thinks we're special. He's given us this law. And we're able to keep it. We're able to please him. And some of them knew they couldn't keep it. And they'd say, but as long as we try hard to keep it, God will forgive us because we're really trying. And guess what? Whether they're being saved on trusting strictly in their own righteousness or God's mercy because they were trying to be righteous, they were still trusting in some way upon their own righteousness. And you have to cast all your confidence, not in your own performance or what you can do for God, but in the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen? It's only through Him that we can be saved. And that's why we must be born again to enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus said when Nicodemus, Nicodemus again, he didn't say, why do I need to be born again? He said, what? How? And I believe that shows you where he's at. That's why Nicodemus was there. He was opening up to Jesus to a degree. And last week I explained, you know, why he seems quite open. So I won't get into that here. Although he still needed to open up more because we look at what Jesus says to him through the rest of that chapter, which we looked at last week. 
Nicodemus was open, but he needed to be opened up more. But Nicodemus doesn't say why, because Nicodemus knows deep down in his heart, he is a failure, just like every one of us. We have all failed God. He doesn't say why. He knows he's a sinner. He probably had a lot, lot of long nights awake thinking, you know what? I'm a fraud. I'm not perfectly righteous. I need God's mercy. I need God's forgiveness. I need a new heart. And he probably wrestled like Paul did when Paul in Romans 7 said the things I don't want to do, I end up doing and the things I don't want to do or that I want to do, I, I, I don't have the power to do. And Nicodemus probably went through that same wrestling match. So when Jesus said, you must be born of water and spirit, he wants to know, how? How can this happen? And then Jesus talked about the blowing of the wind. You know, the wind, when the wind comes, people don't understand where it's really coming from. They don't understand where it's really going. You know, it's funny, the whole, we need to pray about the whole, uh, with Gustav right now, the uh, hurricane that's headed toward our country. And by the way, by the way, it was, it was last week, it's the first day of the week right now, that Condoleezza Rice told the Jews again that they need, to, they need to give land over to the Palestinians. They need to have two states in Israel. And I said, okay, I'm going to look at the news. I bet there's a hurricane coming. And guess what? It was headed, it wasn't even near Cuba yet. There it was. I go, oh, I was going to circle around and hit us. Watch. Boom, here it is. And now you might, if you're visiting Blessed Hope right now, I encourage you to listen to a message I did a while ago called Don't Mess With the Weatherman. It's a three-part series, okay? We have evidence of this over and over and over and over again. You can't dispute it. There's, there's people, uh, man, what's that gentleman's name over in Israel that chronicalizes all these things? I'm trying to remember his name. Bill Koenig. Bill, Bill Koenig. That's Bill Koenig. Look at look Bill Koenig up on Google. He was like a Washington correspondent for some time. And he has a, he's done a ton of research on this. Every time we say that, we get blasted, Okay. And I, and I share scriptures with you, and you have to, you have to, you have to talk to God about this, because I share scriptures with you where God says when you mess with his nation, that he himself, he himself shall discipline you with his storms. That's what he says in his word. So I just believe what his word says. Now, is every time something like that happens an act of God because of something we've done to Israel? No. But guess what? I can show you in scripture where oftentimes it is. And, we can, and what's interesting, before you even make a comment on it, go ahead and look at every time we've done this as a nation, what's happened over and over again. In fact, one of the brothers, Bob Hedge, he heard that message. I did like a three-part message. He said, you know what? This is bizarre. I've got to check this out. So he had one of his employees. He sent him on a wild goose chase. He thought, hey, well, I shouldn't say he thought. He just sent him. He said, hey, I want you to check this out. Look at all the dates for when these people said these different things. Do a search of them, and then look at when these storms came. And this guy's not a Christian. The guy came back to Bob. He goes, you know what? Not only is it accurate, but I'm finding new ones, too. This is scary, you know? Pretty crazy stuff. But, uh, I mean, way back to President Bush Sr. and what have you. God is in control, ultimately. And, and there are things that happen that we don't have a clue as to why they happen. And could the Gustav thing be totally an accident and a coincidence and everything else? Yeah, it's possible. It just could be just a coincidence that it happened with Condoleezza Rice's time. And God's, God's still allowing it for one reason or another. I don't know. But I just know what the God's Word says, and it's quite crazy. But I do know that in Ezekiel, when it speaks of wind, it speaks of the power of God often. And God can use it to discipline us, but he also, wind can also be an incredibly beautiful force that God uses to uh, recreate. In fact, in Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we see something very, very interesting. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. By the way, you could go ahead and order those tapes uh, free of charge. Don't mess with the weatherman. I think it was three parts. They're quite interesting. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. Look at the very beginning of God's creation. In verse 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2. The earth was what? Formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. Wow. Now when God first created the earth, what was it like? It was formless and void. I think that's tohu wa bohu. In the Hebrew, kind of strange sounding language, right? It was tohu wa bohu, formless and void. And darkness, it says, hovered over the deep. That is a description, not only of the earth, when God began to form it, 
but of our lives before Jesus, before we've been born again, I believe, very, very strongly. In fact, I believe the creation days are an incredible picture of God bringing redemption to his people and his plan of salvation. In fact, it's on the third day that life springs forth. It's on the third day that Jesus rose from the dead. Amen? Not after the third day. It says on the third day he rose from the dead. And we see the earth at first. How do we see it? Tohu wabohu. We see it formless and void. Darkness over the face of the deep. But guess what? Isn't that us? How were we before we were born again? We were formless, right? There was no real shape to our lives, huh? We just kind of did whatever. We kind of went with the flow. And we were void. That is, we were empty, huh? We had that emptiness in our hearts that we tried to fill up with alcohol. We tried to fill up with drugs. We tried to fill up with the things of this world or, or a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever the situation might be or some form of entertainment. We kept trying to fill that void. We were lonely. We were empty. And guess what? Like the early earth, we were formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. There was darkness that was just over our entire lives. They were shrouded in spiritual darkness, alienated from God. The Bible describes the non-believer as those who are alienated from him, those who are empty, those who are without shape in their lives, without knowing the purpose of God, and those who are in darkness. That's how we were before we were born again. But what did God do to the early earth? It says in verse 2, the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was what? And the what? And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the what? Waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. Guess what? Jesus said you must be born not only of water, but of what? Spirit. And when you're born of water, I believe first and foremost, contextually there, he's speaking of the watery birth. Because Nicodemus said, right before Jesus said that, Nicodemus said, how can a man be born again? He can't go into his mother's womb and come back out again, can he? And then Jesus said, you must be born of water and spirit, for that which is born of the flesh, out of the womb, is flesh. That's the watery birth. The water is broken. The ambiotic fluid. You, everyone here has come through the water. doesn't matter whether you had a C-section or, you, or the water broke. You were in water. You came out of water. But you can't just be born of the water. Flesh, born of flesh is flesh. You must be born of the what? Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit from heaven, God himself, must come into your life and make you new and give you a new heart. You must be born of water and spirit. Here when we look at when God created the earth, it was formless and void. It was darkness was, you know, shrouded in darkness. But what happened? God's spirit moved over the surface of the waters and brought new life. See, there was water there, but there needed to be what? The work of the Spirit to bring f- and the bringing of the light of life. And what happened to us when we were saved? We had that fleshly, watery birth, but we need to be born of water and of what? Spirit. And God's Spirit came to us. And Jesus said the Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin and of righteousness and judgment. And His Spirit brought light to us, an awareness of our sin through our bringing of the law. It brought, brought us to cry out and wooed us to Himself to cry out, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And when we confess our sins and put our faith in Jesus, he cleansed our sins from our sins and he entered into our hearts. God himself, the life of God, entered into our very hearts, bringing new life, bringing the born again experience. And that's what it means ultimately to be born anew, to be born again, to have the very life of God, to be partakers, as it says in Second Peter chapter 1, that we are partakers of the divine nature doesn't mean that we become divine. He is divine. We are the humans. Amen? He is divine. We are the wretch, right? But he comes into our hearts and makes us new and gives us new life. So now God himself lives in us. It's no longer we that live, but it's him that lives in us and through us. At least that's the way it's supposed to be for the believer. Amen? God live in me. God live through me. May your spirit dwell in me. May your spirit empower me for service. May my hands, my feet be used as instruments of righteousness to bring blessing and encouragement to others. Amen? So, 
It's imperative that we understand that we must be born not only of water, but of spirit. And water is a picture of the word of God. We know that because John 15, verse 3, Jesus said, you are already clean through the word that I've spoken to you. Amen. And we know that that's one of the agents that God uses to bring us to being born again. Not just the spirit of God, but the water of his word. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, you know, it talks about how Husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church who gave himself for her and cleansed her through the washing of the water of the word of God. And we know the word of God is an agent in the born again experience in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 through 26, where it says that we've been born again in 1 Peter, not of uh, uh, corruptible things, but of the incorruptible word of God. Did you know that? It says that we've been born again by the incorruptible word of God. So in that sense, we're born again by the water of his word, and we're born again of the spirit of God. We must be born not only of water, but of what? Spirit. Amen? So as believers, when did we become born again? When the word of God entered into our hearts, and we heard the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins. Amen? And when we received that word, we received him. And we embraced him through faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And he that believes when the faith comes by hearing, Romans chapter uh, 10, that Jesus Christ, right? He that believes that Jesus Christ died for our sins, right? And he rose again. He that believes that God, he that confesses that he is Lord shall be what? Saved. Actually, it says if he that believes you know, in his heart that God raised him from the dead, you know, he that confesses him as Lord, it says he'll be saved. But that's through the word. That's why it says in 1 Peter chapter 2, or 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 24 through 26, that we're born again, not of corruptible word, but of the incorruptible word of God. You see, the incorruptible word is talking about the seed, the seed of his word there in 1 Peter. Let me make sure I'm getting that uh, verse right. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm going strictly from memory here, but it's a very interesting uh, passage. And when you get there, near the end of your Bible, 1 Peter chapter 1. Quite amazing. What an experience we have. And it's like the, the, it's called the seed, the sperma. It's the seed of his word enters the ovum of our heart. And it's not until our heart embraces the seed of his word that new life, spiritual life, takes place. Chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Yeah, let's uh, pick it up all the way back at verse 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been what? Born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off. But the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. You see, we've been born again by his word. And Jesus said, you must be born of the what? Spirit. So when God's word is shared with us in one way or another, and the Holy Spirit illumines our hearts, the light comes in, right? We were formless. We were void. We were in darkness. The light of God's word comes in. The spirit of God speaks to us to open up to God, to surrender to him, to recognize that we are sinners, to recognize that we cannot save ourselves, to recognize that we are doomed without God. And then we come to the end of ourselves and say, God, have mercy on me. And we open up our hearts to him. It says in John 1, 12, as many as received him, he gave the right to become the children of God. Then we receive the Lord and say, Lord, come into me. Then we become children of God because his seed is, mixed with faith, produces the fruit of new life. And God comes into our lives. And the Holy Spirit lives in us. And God gives us a new heart and changes our hearts. It makes us something altogether different than we were before we had faith in Christ. And that's a miracle, guys. That's a miracle from God. In fact, it's such a miracle, it's far different than somebody going to an AA meeting. Well, I'm going to AA, I stopped drinking. That's great, someone stops drinking. But that doesn't save you. In fact, it's such a miraculous experience. I know, and I, I know to this very day, there's people from my past 
And now I've been saved for some time now, but for years they'd run into some of my past and they could, they'd have a hard time believing that I became a Christian because they couldn't understand how I, I could change. You know? Susie shared with me that somebody came to the office or called the office a year and a half ago. Is this the same Joe Schimmel that went to Roll High? You know, somebody I hadn't seen in years and years and years. I can't believe that that guy's a Christian now, you know? Where people that know me now and don't know me before I was a Christian... And somebody tells me a story about me in my past, it's hard for them to believe. Joe did what? You know? Same thing's true of you. Isn't that true? If we knew about your past, and a lot of us were like, what? You know? And people from your past would have a hard time seeing that you singing praise songs to Jesus now, you know? Because it's such a transformation. It's a miracle that takes place. In fact, last uh, service, the very first service, I was tripping out because, you know, I was talking about being born again and how the Lord changes our hearts and how, you know, my heart was just messed up, man. I had a dark heart before I was saved. And, and you know, God saved me. And, and there I saw, you saw my mom who wasn't saved. I saw my brother Tom was sitting over here. I saw my sister Kathy. And, and I saw Peggy and Patty were sitting on this side. Three of my sisters, my brother, my mom, and, and myself. And, you know, we're all changed. If you knew our family before we were saved, it was, you know, everybody's going in different directions. You know, we didn't have a unity in Christ. We didn't have... Uh, you know, we, if I would have kept going the path I was on, I was a very destructive person. You know, I'd probably be dead. I, and I don't, I don't say that. You hear that? People say that. That's probably true in my life. We're really messed up. Steve could say it. Hardy, amen. 25 years later, if I kept that route, man. Yeah, he's saying amen over there. I would be messed up. He was a good friend of mine back then. He, we were both pretty lost, you know. But Tom, you know, even, and if I, after I got saved, I mean, Tom was going to bars and he was kind of, following in my footsteps with brawling with people and everything. And you wouldn't know that about Tom in the past. You got saved, you know. Sister Kathy, you know, trusting in her own self and, you know, what she was doing in society, but lost in a broken marriage. And boom, she was saved, got saved out of that, man. Peggy, and she was a coke fiend and everything else. I mean, she was a bad girl, got saved. Patty, <laughs> Patty, she was lost too. I'm going to be mellow on Patty right now. Because she sometimes takes the brunt of the, the jokes sometimes. But she was lost. And, and you know what? Now I trip out. God's changed our hearts. We just all love the Lord. We love our brothers and sisters in Christ. We love each other. It's, the, it's a miracle. It's the power of Jesus Christ. You know? And my mom, I mean, she was, she's, well, before she was saved, yeah, she's always been, seen, you know, a nice lady and stuff. But she had her own hang-ups like everybody else. She needed Jesus. God's changed our hearts. That's the miracle of God. Only God can do that. It's not religion. You see, before I was a Christian, we had religion. I was brought up going to a Catholic church, you know, catechism and stuff like that. But I'd come home from church as a little kid, you know, and I'd go steal somebody else's pot plants, you know, and I was growing my own pot plants, you know, and I, you know, was ripping things off, you know, even ripped off a few houses, got involved in stuff with the other kids just in my neighborhood. They were doing things. Hey, you want to come? kind of afraid at first, and all of a sudden you start doing these things. And you have guilt, like, that was wrong. You know something's wrong with you. But you kind of just go with the flow, and before you know it, man, you're just so lost. But everybody was lost, I knew. Even people that were religious. And then I think it was like 6th, 7th grade, man, my parents even stopped going to the Catholic Church. And I had my, I was very anti-God. I thought Christianity was a joke. I was so lost. If I was left to myself, if God did not knock on my heart and enter into my life, my life would have just been worse and worse as time went on. I wouldn't have a family. I, could, I wouldn't have been faithful to my wife. You know, I'm just saying, I'm, I'd be your typical man out there without Jesus. And, but, but God's given me a new heart, and that's through, what, that's through being born again. Because the Spirit of God lives in me. It's not about a religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ, Him living in us. And you know what's so awesome about being around my brothers and sisters in Christ? Because we have a very sincere fellowship here at Blessed Hope. Is seeing how many people in our fellowship, seeing all these people that are born again. I'd rather be around my brothers and sisters in Christ a thousand times to one or beyond that than with non-believers. No doubt about it. I remember my sister Peggy, it just sticks in my mind. I shared this before because it kind of stunned me. She said, you know what, when you first got saved, she goes, I used to feel sorry for you. You first got saved and all of a sudden, and it took me a while before I found a Christian church. She goes, but then you started getting up and going to church. And, and, uh, and I started thinking, poor guy, you know, 
he has to go to church on Sundays and we get to sleep in. And she said, and then I got saved. And I thought, wow, this is what I've been missing. You know, and we're thinking, poor them, they wake up with a hangover and messed up and who knows how many fights they got and what kind of bills they have now and everything else that's messed up in the world. And that's the way it really is because we were there. But they haven't been where we've been until they actually are born, born again. Amen. Then we come to know Jesus and our lives just wholly change, you know. And it's amazing and because it's like she was blown away. She was like, wow. Because, you don't, because keep in mind, before she was a Christian, when we were in elementary school, we went to a Catholic church. And it was just dead religion. But now that we know God, we realize it's not about the building and theatrics and rituals. It's about knowing God and loving God with your whole heart, soul, and strength. Loving your brothers and sisters in Christ. Growing together. Fulfilling the mission He's given us of reaching the lost. And glorifying Him with our hearts and our songs. Amen. And living for Him and being a blessing one to another. And what a rich life it is. How could I bring my children up in anything else other than knowing Jesus? Amen. And the life they can have in Christ. It's like a deaf man. I was like a deaf man when I first got born again who didn't realize he was deaf until I realized at the end that I was spiritually blind and spiritually deaf. And then it's like my, your ears open and all of a sudden you just start hearing the hallelujahs and the praises and the worship of God. And I remember my first time stepping into a worship service where people were lifting their hands singing those old 70s hymns and early 80s hymns, you know, like seek ye first the kingdom of God and, and sing hallelujah to the Lord and, and, and humble thyself in the name of the Lord and all these wonderful, beautiful, remember those old choruses, those Maranatha type choruses? And people lifting their hands and the tears began to stream and I began to get a taste of the kingdom of God and then my eyes were open where everything was now no longer just uh, bleak and ugly but I began to see the kingdom of God people citizens of the kingdom loving one another being what God's called us to be what a glorious awesome truth and all of a sudden I was no longer this blind man but it's like my eyes the eyes of a blind man blind man being opened up in an art gallery but a living art gallery of the kingdom of God and what a transformation that was and what a lie it is when the world tries to beckon us back if we ever say yes to it because it's such a lie. It's so disgusting. It's so empty. It's dark. It's void. It's formless. It has nothing for us. Amen? That's why it says don't go back and be conformed to those things from which you've been uh, saved from, Peter says in his book. So what a glorious truth it is. In fact, turn to Second Peter chapter 4. There's a, uh, we're in First Peter. Go to Second Peter. And I know we've, you know, welcome to Blessed Hope because we like to do this. I mean, we've been in John, we've been in Genesis, we've been in Second Peter, we've been in Ezekiel, uh, mentioned in Ezekiel, but we've been in uh, First, uh, uh, now we're in First Peter, we've been in Second Peter, we've been in Romans 3. But that's good for you, amen, because you get to know the Bible, you get to see God's message. We want God's word, amen. So I'm sorry, we're supposed to be in, we're Second Corinthians. Second Corinthians, I'm sorry. Now you're in 2 Corinthians. So you're in 2 Peter, you just didn't read anything. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Look what it says here. Paul says, even if our gospel, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God you see, Satan has blinded the minds, a small God, little g, the God of this world system, has blinded the minds of those that believe not, lest the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them and set them free. The world doesn't understand this. I didn't. When I was lost and, I, and somebody would share the gospel, or I'd hear about Jesus Christ, I was just so ignorant and blind and I would mock it. I was such a loser, man. The capital L. I'd mock the gospel. Mock that. I didn't really understand what was going on. But you know, it says, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he said that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. And when someone mocks the gospel, let them know. You know what? I wouldn't do that, man. The Bible says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. You know, that was me. I was perishing. It was foolishness. But praise God. God saves those who are perishing. God so loved the world, Jesus said that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him should not, what? Perish, but have everlasting life. That's the good news. But look at verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord, and ourselves as your bondservants of, for Jesus' sake. For God who said, now check this out, for God who said, light shall shine out of darkness. You know, and that's from Genesis. He's referring back to when God said, let there be light. He said, is the one who has what? 
shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. And what's he doing? Remember how he's showing you when God created the earth and it was formless and void and dark and then the light came and the spirit hovered over the water that we must be born again of the spirit and that's a picture of what needs to happen in us? Well, guess what? That's not from me. That's from Paul. Paul right here is telling us that that's what God did when he created the earth. He brought the light and brought a recreation. Okay? And I'm not saying there was a gap between verses 1 and 2. A lot of people teach that gap three of millions of years. I'm not saying that. I just believe God created it darkness and, you know, without form and, you know, void as an illustration of what he, boom, could do by his power. And guess what? He's done that in our hearts. He said, let there be light in the heart of Joe Shemel. May he be quickened. May he become a new person in my son. And I was transformed. The same knock happens to everybody. Jesus enlightens the heart of every man that comes in the world. John 1, 9 says that. But if you open the door and invite him in, and receive that seed, that incorruptible seed, in the ovum of your heart, so to speak, from a spiritual standpoint, you'll become a new creation. And what will happen? Look at chapter 5, the very next chapter. Look at verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a what? New creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. In fact, it's not religion. In Galatians, Paul says, circumcision and uncircumcision availeth nothing. They don't change the heart. He says this, it's the new creation that counts. God is into making new creations. That's the message that we have as Christians. Not, hey, people, get religious. Get some religion. Religion will be good for you. That's not our message. Our message is you must be born again. And our message is that you can be born again. And it's good news because Jesus died for you to pay for your sins so you can be cleansed and enter the kingdom of God and have not just a clean slate before God and be declared righteous, but your nature can be changed. You can become a new person in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yeah, that's right, Lenny. You can have peace with God. Oh, he's telling me two minutes. That's right, two minutes. Sorry, bro. Okay. <laughs> Thought he was helping me preach there for a second, man. We have, don't have, that's hippie peace. We have the peace of Jesus anyway, amen? So, praise God. We're new creatures in Christ. And John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? Now, why do I mention John 3, 16? Because that's what Jesus, that was his answer to Nicodemus. When he said, how can I be born again? You keep reading John. He talks about how the serpent was lifted up, the brass serpent on the pole. And those who were dying because of snake bites looked to the pole. And if they looked, they were given life. But they were given bio life, physical life. That's a picture for us. When we look to Jesus, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes him should not perish but have what? Eternal life. We are given not bio, but zoe. That's the Greek word for spiritual life. We're given the life of God. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus comes to live in our hearts. Amen. John 3.16 and John 3.17. For the son... A man did not come to the world, said Jesus. The very next verse he tells Nicodemus, to condemn the world, but that the world through him should be what? Saved. That's good news. We have, a, we have good news for everybody. The angels came when Jesus was born. They said to the shepherds, this is good news for all men. It's good news. It reminds me of the traveler who was sinking in the quicksand. As much as he fought to get out, the deeper he got, he was dying. He was perishing there in the jungle. And Confucius comes by and says, wow, this is a good way to teach that men ought to avoid such experiences. You know? And then uh, Muhammad came by and he said, you know what? This must, alas, be Allah's will for this man. It was predestined to be. And then the man continued to perish. You know? And then you know, Buddha came and, and said, you know, uh, better luck in the next life you know, to the man. And, and then Jesus came by and simply reached down, held out his hand, took hold of the man's hand and pulled him up out of the quicksand. What differentiates Jesus Christ from all the other religions is every other religion says, hey, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Do as much as you can and then maybe God will help you. But God says we can't save ourselves. And if we try to save ourselves, Jesus said we'll lose our lives. But God so loves us that he came to die for us and not to condemn us, but to save us, amen, to reach his hand out and pull us out of our sin and not only cleanse us, 
from all unrighteousness, but give us new hearts. Amen? And that's what Nicodemus should have known. Because in Ezekiel, God told Nicodemus, and he's told him through the other prophets, the scholars of Israel knew this, that God said, he prophesied, that the leopard can't change its spots. We can't change ourselves. But that God said he would give them a new heart and a new spirit. And that he'd take out that heart of stone, that hardened heart that even the Pharisees had, and he'd replace it with a heart of flesh, a softened heart that would be sensitive to God. And that he'd give a new covenant and write his laws in our hearts and give us his spirit, amen, and renew a right spirit in, it, spirit in us. Create in me a clean heart, David prayed. The word create there is ex nihilo. It's talking about uh, out of nothing, the, the uh, Septuagint. And, and that's the same word when God created the heavens and the earth. You see, he creates in us a new heart. Amen? And all you need for that to happen is not to be good enough. You need to recognize that you're not good enough, that you're a sinner, and that you can't be saved by your own righteousness, and that Jesus did die for you, and he longs to save you if you haven't been saved and all you need to do is sincerely in your heart say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I turn from my own ways and my own life, and I embrace Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Simply pray this prayer right now if that's you. Father, forgive me of my sins. I need to be born again. I know it. I don't ask why because I know I'm a sinner. I don't ask how because Nicodemus did and your son explained how to be saved by putting my faith in Jesus. So Lord, I put my faith in Jesus right now and I believe in my heart that he died for me and that he rose from the dead and I confess with my mouth that he is Lord. And because of your word, I believe I am saved. I'm born again in Jesus' name. And Father, for those of us who are born again, we pray that we would rely on your spirit and not go back to trusting our flesh and that we'd ask you daily to forgive us and to fill us with your strength and with your power so that your divine nature could live in us and through us and so we could be empowered to live the life that only you can live through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Let us please stand and pass out the cup and the bread. What a glorious thing it is to be born of God, amen? To be born of the spirit of God. How many of you are happy that uh, you've been born again, that God's changed your heart, amen? And how many of you, rec- praise God, glorify the Lord. We do glorify you, Lord. We praise your holy name. You are so worthy to be praised. Praise God. And you might say, I'm born again, but man, I wish God would hurry up because I need to grow more. Well, guess what? When you look at the Bible, it talks about those who are born of God. It talks about those who are babes in Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Hebrews chapter 5. Those who are young people in Christ, spiritually, spiritual adolescents, uh, 1 John chapter 2. Those who are fathers in Christ, 1 Timothy, uh, Corinthians, uh, 1 John 2 again. And there's a spiritual growth that takes place in our lives, amen? And as we submit to God, we grow more and more. But if you're trusting Jesus, you are born again. If you're truly trusting him, if he's first in your life. Not if he's some sidekick or somebody that you give some ambiance to on Sunday morning, but if he's... You're Lord. You're born of God. How do I know that? 1 John 5, 1 says that he that believes that Jesus is the Christ is what? Born of God. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ, you're trusting him. You're born of God. And how did Nicodemus tell, or how did Jesus tell Nicodemus? What, how do you answer him about being born again? For God so loved the world, right, that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever, what? Believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's the life. The eternal life. That's the life of God living in you that you will have forever through faith in Christ. That's what it means to be born again. Amen. Father, we thank you so much for the clarity of your word and the clarity of Jesus' answer to Nicodemus, Father, that we're born again through faith in your Son. And we thank you for your forgiveness, Father. And we thank you, Father, that our salvation will not be based on the Quran, which teaches that good works and bad works will be put on a huge scale and whichever works outweigh the other will get us in or out, Lord. We know in truth that we'd be doomed, Father, because even all of our righteousness is as filthy rags, and everything would be put on the other side of the scale, Lord, and we'd all be doomed. But we thank you, Father, that Christ's righteousness and his life is what merits for us 
through his death, burial, and resurrection, your gift, Lord, his work and not ours. For it's by grace that we are saved, Father, not of ourselves, it's your gift, not of works as anyone should boast. Lord, we thank you for your great grace today, your great love for us. We partake of the bread, which so wonderfully represents the simplicity of the gospel and that your son, the bread from heaven, gave himself for us on the cross. We partake of it in Jesus' name.